My uh, goal today is just to talk to you a little bit about antibiotic stewardship metrics. Um, I'm glad that we had a little kind of pull of hands earlier to see what professions people are, but I am interested to know a little bit about the hospital or the facility that you come from. So by a show of hands, how many of you work in a large academic medical center or large community hospital? Okay. And then how about mid-size uh, hospital, community hospital? Okay, and then how, how about it's like small or critical access hospitals? Yes, okay, great. I, I'm excited. This is, this is um, great to see you all here, and um, I certainly want to thank uh, the, the organizers for inviting me today. I'm, uh, this is a really amazing symposium, so I'm so glad to be part of it. So I'm going to focus my talk, since there were a lot of folks that raised their hand that are from small and critical access hospitals, I do want to spend a little time just kind of walking through the basics and maybe giving you some ideas on how you can um, pull your data. Because I know I work with hospitals, you know, very small, very large, and everywhere in between. And I know that when we talk about antibiotic metrics, it's an easy, well, somewhat easy conversation when you're working with large hospitals, academic medical centers. I say somewhat easy because the hard part about that is that you usually have to go through someone else to get your data. Um, but I'm betting a lot of you probably are going to be the ones in your institution that would pull the data. Uh, and so I really want to give you some practical strategies that you can take back that will help you in terms of your efforts in trying to, to measure and monitor antibiotic use. So here's my objectives for this session, um, and I have no disclosures. Okay, so what we've all day long the theme is around the CDC core elements. What do they say about measuring antibiotic use? And you can see there for each of the four key core elements, um, or, or the, I'm sorry, for each of the four different core elements for the um, different uh, facility types, measurement is mentioned in each one of those. Um, I do find it interesting, I kind of noticed when I was looking at the slide uh, earlier today, I did notice that there was a lot of detail in the critical access hospital guideline around metrics, even more so than the acute care uh, core elements, and I think it's just because we, over time, are learning about how to better track antibiotic use, and there's more mechanisms now, obviously, through the CDC's AU option um, to help us do that. What do organizations say about measuring antibiotic use? So it's in the, the IDSA SHEA guidelines. Um, the focus there is obviously they're encouraging people to measure their antibiotic use based on utilization or prescriptions, not cost. And I'll talk about why measure, measuring your stewardship program on cost only um, has a lot of limitations. Um, some of you, a lot of you are probably Joint Commission accredited, as you know, and as Scott mentioned, there was there are a lot of mention about metrics in the Joint Commission Medication Management Standards for Stewardship. Um, DNV, I don't know, is anybody here accredited by DNV? No, okay, one. So I don't even, I think, I, I wasn't able to really find anything related to stewardship. Um, LeapFrog, that's another kind of quality organization that surveys a number of hospitals. Um, they have a mention of it in there. And then w I know we probably don't have a lot of freestanding peds hospitals here, but in the US News and World Report uh, you, um, hospital ranking system that they use in the questionnaire, they don't necessarily ask about metrics, but they ask, do you have an analyst to help support your program, which obviously they would be generating metrics for you. So we're going to start with the basics, and then I'll get kind of lead you up to some more complex metrics towards the end of my talk. Okay. So this is a graph that I um, put together that kind of helps to map out the different categories where you can measure things for stewardship. And um, this is from a highly reputable journal resource called My Brain. This is where this came from. So it's not cited, it's not published, it just can't. I probably came up with this at 10 o'clock in some hotel room at night when I was doing slides. But um, so anyhow, so what I did was I kind of map out for you uh, the different categories of, of, of measuring antibiotic use. And so along the um, x-axis, you know, if you think about it from actual reflection of, uh, of utilization, of antibiotic utilization data, kind of starting from the left, financial would be sort of the worst, right? And then in theory, as we move on up the scale and get to the gold standard, which is now the, um, uh, the, the uh, days of therapy per 1,000 patient days present, in theory, that would be, you know, highly reflective of your actual antibiotic use patterns. Um, but we, we always default to financial because that's the easiest to obtain. And so I'm going to walk through and kind of talk about each of these and, and talk about the strengths and weaknesses. So let's start with financial. Now, I will tell you that if the only information or the only way you can measure your antibiotic use is through financial or purchase data, 
then I say go for it, right? Because it's better than nothing. It's a place to start. So I don't, I don't want to just poo-poo it and say, oh, you know, don't. I mean, I'm sure all of you are measuring your costs for other things, but if this is all you have, if all you can do is go into your wholesaler and run a report um, and you want to focus on, you know, the HFS category for antibiotics and, and that's all you can get, then that's just fine. Just start there. Um, and so a lot of people look at costs in different mechanisms and, and um, you know, we, we like to put cost as the numerator. We, we like to put it, it over a denominator. So we look at things like cost per patient day or cost per adjusted patient day. Now, the difference is that if you're, if you're looking at your spend of antibiotics, um, and especially if you have a lot, a lot of outpatient and you're just kind of, or, or an outpatient uh, IV clinic or somewhere where you're giving a lot of outpatient antibiotics, um, if you're just if you're pulling your aggregate spend, you kind of got to adjust for that, and so we do what's called an adjustment factor. So that's the difference between cost per patient day and cost per adjusted patient day. Okay, so if you're just strictly pulling your inpatient antibiotic spend, then you're going to map it over your inpatient patient days. Um, some people look at cost percent to a total bud, uh, drug budget. That's really not super helpful from uh, an antibiotic metric standpoint. Total spend. Um, can be a challenge just because obviously if your patient census changes, so will your spend. Uh, I do, I think looking at wastage is good just from a general stewardship principle standpoint. I'm always amazed at the percent of drugs that are used in this country, uh, antibiotics and otherwise that go in the trash. And so that's an opportunity certainly from a, um, a cost saving standpoint. Uh, but other costs we have listed there, some of the systems that I've worked with can do things like track cost per MSDRG, so pull different you know, MSDRGs for ID-related um, li service lines and look at cost that way, cost per length of stay, and then cost due to readmissions, which is sounds really awesome, but it's super, super hard to do. So here's the downside to measuring your antibiotic use uh, by cost if you just s simply rely on financial metrics. So cost equals utilization times price, but there are so many things that can influence cost, right? Let's say, um, you know, the, the typical rumor like, oh, Zosin's gonna be short. Well, that's like con a constant thing, right? Or Cefepime's gonna be short. Or, or something's gonna be short. Some drug is gonna be short. So we better stock up, right? And sometimes that is true. It is gonna be short. And other times we're just inducing a shortage because <laughs> everybody's doing a buy-in. But, you know, an inventory build. So that will increase your numerator or your spend. Um, you know, it does also vary depending on if you're a DISH hospital or 340B, you'll be paying different prices for drugs than non-340B hospitals, non-DISH hospitals. Uh, generic launches, you know, the, the classic, I, I have sat in many a meeting, and I work with a lot of, you know, um, groups around the stewardship, and, and I've, I've sat in these meetings where they say, we're doing so good on daptomycin use, our costs have gone down by 60%. So we, we are definitely, you know, our stewardship program is working, we're using less daptomycin. It's like, well, no, it's because it's generic, but I don't say that. Um, but you know, it's, it's true. Uh, drug shortages, oh my goodness, this can really, you know, if you have to shift and buy something that's off contract, for example, that can really, really mess with your costs um, and overly inflate it. So if you're following cost only, I think you kind of get the point that that, that is, um, can be you know, not an accurate representation of utilization. And I use this example on the right, this is sort of based off of an echinocannon, I won't say which one, but um, just sort of if you look back in the trends of echinocannon pricing, for example, and let's say every year since 2011, your hospital, your institution bought 1,000 doses, well in, in 2011 you would have paid $335, and so your spend for that would have been $335,000. And now it's $75 a dose. So people would look at that and say, hey, look, we decreased our antibiotic utilization. But the reality is you only decreased your purchase price. You still have the same amount of utilization. So that's why that's misleading. So if you, um, but another, I, I think a relatively easy metric that almost anybody could do is what we call the defined daily dose. And um, we want to, you know, ideally you want to be using and calculating this based off of your utilization data. But if you don't have a good way to get that, go ahead, go ahead and use, take what you've bought and just instead of using cost, just use how many grams and that can factor into the calculation, which I'll walk through. So um, because in theory, if you think about it, 
your inventory should hopefully, unless you do these builds or burns, they, it should stay the same. So it would at least give you somewhat of a surrogate of your antibiotic use. Um, but this is a standard that was created by the World Health Organization. And the idea, and they were really brilliant because they came together um, way back in the 1960s and said, hey, we need to figure out a way to measure drug use and, and not just antibiotic use, but drug use. And we need to come up with a standard that will allow us to um, do this across different countries, okay? So this is a group that was in Norway, and um, it was later adopted by the World Health Organization as a standard you know, way to measure an, um, drug use and specifically antibiotic use. And so what you do is you, you, it gives you, they give you this factor, and I'll kind of walk through, but the way you calculate your defined daily dose is you take the total units or grams of drugs that you, that you use, and you divide it by a correction factor, and I'll show you how to look that up on the website. Um, so the pro of this is it attempts to convert raw purchasing or utilization, or you can use it to convert raw purchasing data into sort of a surrogate for utilization data. Um, the nice thing is if you're using the same methodology as you're using, as you're using, in theory, you guys could compare across the board and kind of benchmark against each other. And it's really easy to calculate, as you'll see here in a minute. Uh, the cons are not everybody agrees with the DDDs. There are some specific differences between the DDDs uh, um, uh, or I would say there are differences in terms of, you know, if you look at how they've calculated the defined daily dose and you compare that to maybe an average dose that we use here in the U.S., in some cases there's, there's differences. So a, a common one is ceftriaxone. The defined daily dose that they use uh, through the World Health Organization is two. Um, the most common dose in the U.S. is one gram per day, so two grams versus one gram. So sometimes there are differences, um, and I'll show you one here with levofloxacin. Um, and it doesn't really, there, there are some other limitations that I have in a later slide. So this is what the World, Horse, World Health Organization website for DDDs look like. If you Google DDD, it'll take you to some computer technology company. So just Google WHO DDD, or you can pull the website off of this slide. Um, but you'll basically see what you do is you go in and you enter a, a drug, any drug. So in this case, I've got a visual here that shows you, I, I entered piperacillin, and they just have it listed, they don't have tazobactam, but they have piperacillin and an en en enzyme inhibitor. Now what's interesting is this is a combination product, so they actually measure it off of the active antibiotic, um, and they quantify it in grams, and so you can kind of think how, how uh, piperacillin and tazobactam is typically dosed. So this does get a little, like I said, kind of a little off when you compare it to sort of how we use drugs here in the US. Um, so but the defined daily dose, that bottom number from that previous slide, that correction factor in this case would be 14. So um, I walk through just in the next couple of slides an example of how you calculate the DDD. And I like to do this because I want you to be able to take your time when you get back to your institution if you haven't done this before and kind of walk through this example and practice it. Um, and I think I, I'm pretty sure I have my contact information at the end of this presentation. So if anybody ever has any questions, you can always feel free to email me and I can walk through it with you in more detail. Um, so let's just say you get a report of levofloxacin use for the month of January, and you have given 300 doses of levofloxacin, 750 milligrams IV, and 150 doses of the 500 milligram oral. So what is, let's calculate the total DDD, okay? And so the way that we do that, I'm gonna use my nice new pointer that somebody handed me, that Jasmine handed me here. Hold on, let's see. Let's see if I can get that. Uh, is the pointer on the side? Oh, the other side. Okay, all right. Well, I'll just kind of walk through. Oh, that's too technical. Okay, let me just use this pointer. Okay, let me show you. <laughs> so high tech here. <laughs> okay, so let's walk through. Um, so you can see there, I have each of the, the doses of levofloxacin listed, the total number dispensed or used, then you calculate uh, total milligrams, then you convert that to grams. Okay, so that's your numerator uh, there in the third to the last column. And then you're dividing it by the World Health Organization DDD, which is 0.5 grams. Okay, so that's a little misleading too, because you're, I think people get confused because there's two different strengths here, but we're using the same defined daily dose. And so in that case, you're, you're, you would calculate your defined daily dose um, for the 500 would be 150, and the 750 would be 450 there in the right-hand column. But we like to put that and express it over um, a, a, me a metric for census that kind of you know, shows or cor corrects for our um, differences in patient census. And so at the bottom, you, kinda, you can walk through the calculation there on the right-hand side. 
So let's say during that time period, we had 7,500 days. So then our DDD per 1,000 patient days for 500 would be 20, and for 750 would be 60. Okay, so that's, I've got all the calculations. It's hard to follow in a lecture and when you're trying to get through information quickly, um, but just take that back and kind of walk through that exercise and you'll see how you can calculate that. So the challenge, it's not always perfect, but hey, you know, don't let great in the way of good. You gotta start somewhere. As I mentioned, the combination products are a bit tricky. Um, we get into things like colistin and penicillin where you get into to units and it gets, really, it gets really confusing sometimes. So, you know, I would say, for penicillin, maybe just until you get you know, more used to calculating, maybe stay away from some of those drugs and kind of start with the, the more basic ones that are calculated in milligrams or grams. Um, and you know, but this is a good way to kind of compare yourself to yourself. And like I said, if all you have is purchase data, you can still calculate it. Just um, take your units that you bought, calculate, turn it into grams, and then calculate your DDD from there. Days of therapy, so this is the one I would say, I think this is really the most common and probably readily accepted metric. Now we are, you know, we are moving towards getting more people um, into the AUR, um, but a lot of hospitals that I work with still are using days of therapy per thousand patient days as their primary metric for measuring antibiotic use. And so the definition of days of therapy is aggregate sum of days for which any amount of specific antimicrobial agent was administered to individual patients. Um, I think one of the areas where people get tripped on, up on days of therapy is if you have a drug, for example, that's given a couple times a day, um, you, you still would count that as one day of therapy. So here's an example. Let's say a patient came in on, day, on the first day, got a dose of, of our favorite drug for the afternoon, Piptazo, um, and Vanco, our two favorite drugs. And, um, and so they got the first dose, and then they also got a dose of Vanco on day one. And then day two, they got um, full doses of Piptazo, a dose of Vanco, and then you can see they continued the Vanco out for day three and day four. So that's a total of six days of therapy. That's how you calculate that. And ideally, we'd want to, the easiest way to calculate that and get that is from um, our uh, EMAR or BCMA data. So here, here's an example, and this is done a bunch of different ways. Some hospitals can actually just, you know, push a button and push out the days of therapy report. Um, but one way maybe you could do it in, in your smaller hospital is even manually just kind of, you know, make a notation every day, or if you have the ability to run a, an order report or a med-administered report where you can actually look at, you know, what was given, um, you know, that's a great resource for information. But here's just another example. This is a hospital I work with that had the ability, they would, um, they could generate some reports out of their um, McKesson system, and so they were able to kind of, and this was actually based more on order data, not administered. Administer would be better, but it, it, at least it was a start. And so you could look at, you know, in this case, they had 20 um, days of therapy that were given of vancomycin one gram every 12 hours. They had 30 days of therapy, uh, and the order was one gram every 24 hours. You can kind of see on and on. So in this case, they had 60 uh, days of therapy over 500 patient days. And so again, we, we do this calculation where we express it for 1,000 patient days, and I have it there for you. So their days of therapy for that particular month for vancomycin was 120 days of therapy per 1,000 patient days. It's like math. I feel like we're in math class. <laughs> okay, and so here's kind of a listing of pros and cons of DDD. The biggest, the biggest I guess, the biggest negative about a defined daily dose is that it doesn't really, it's not, it can be used in peds, and it doesn't really or account for like renal dysfunction, you know, when we reduce drugs because patients have renal insufficiency, and it can, they also change it. So sometimes if they've changed the DDD and you have a lot of historical data, it's hard to sort of track that because if the DDD changes, then your data is gonna change as well. Um, so that's why, you know, days of therapy are great, especially if you're doing anything in pediatrics. It's not as influenced, or it's not influenced like it would be with the changes that we see with the DDD. Um, and, you know, although sometimes it can overestimate drugs, and it can be more difficult to measure, obviously, if you don't have access to electronic data. Um, here's just a comparison. This is a study that was done 
a little over 10 years ago by Ron Polk and colleagues where they looked and compared, they, they pulled antibiotic use data from 130 hospitals across the country uh, and they actually calculated days of therapy and compared that to the same, they, they calculated the same metric uh, for defined daily dose. And so they found in some cases, you know, they lined up, but in other cases there were some big differences. So that just kind of shows you that they're not necessarily apples to apples. Um, other common denominators, so you heard this morning, and Arjun talked about um, the AU um, and, and doing uh, like per 1,000 patient days present. So, but other, other numbers that we put at the bottom, you, sometimes I'll see people do look at antibiotic use per admission, per discharge. Um, discharges, the, the downside of that is it excludes patients who expire in the hospital. And um, remember, you should al always exclude healthy newborns from that number. And then some people, I'll, I'll see systems especially like to do um, like uh, antibiotic days of therapy per some case mix index adjusted denominator. And the idea is that, well, my big academic medical center has a lot higher QD patients, so I can case mix index adjust it and make that sort of comparative to my community hospital, my system. Um, and, uh, and so, eh, I don't know if that's really been validated. It kind of makes sense. It always makes the academic medical center people feel better because <laughs> they're like, see, we're not as bad as you said we were. <laughs> but, you know, so anyhow, uh, I don't think it's really been validated, though. Um, other utilization metrics uh, talked about the, the DOT per 1,000 patient days present, IV to PO percentage or, or what, what percent of my therapy am I giving orally. Um, length of therapy, that's kind of an interesting one I've seen people do per 1,000 patient days. That's, I like that metric, but it's hard to... To measure, but that's a good one to look and see, you know, not only how, how much are we using, but how long are we giving it. Um, and here's an easy one. Just go in and how many, just report out, like, how many patients are on antibiotics in a day or every time they, you know, or per visit. Um, I would say that probably in the average hospital at any given time, between 60 and 70 percent of, of patients are on antibiotics. So I think that's another kind of, you know, it, it, what does it tell you? I mean, it probably tells you that you're using a lot of antibiotics in most of your patients, but um, I think it's just kind of good for an awareness factor. Like, did you know that, you know, in 70% of our patients are getting antibiotics? I, I just think that's kind of a, it gets people's attention. Um, I used to work um, PRN on the weekends, trying to pay off my college loans at uh, Miami County Medical Center in Paola, Kansas, Critical Access Hospital. And I remember one weekend I came in, I was, you know, just doing, doing my pharmacy stuff, and uh, we had two little ladies, like almost the same age, had the same physician. They're both on our favorite drug, Piptazo. And I'm dating myself, because I'll tell you, I called, the, I called the physician and I said, hey, you know, Dr. So-and-so, I just would like to let you know that 100% of our patients are on Piptazo in the hospital today. Um, and I didn't have any, I was running out and I didn't want to drive, I was so lazy, I didn't want to drive 30 miles to the big hospital to go get some Pipitazo. So I, I, I switched them to Timentin, one of the patients. So I'm totally dating myself because that obviously some people are like, what the heck is Timentin, right? Um, it, it was an antibiotic at one point, you know? <laughs> so, uh, but anyhow, I, I always like that antidote. 100 patients, 100% 100 of patients in our hospital are in an antibiotics. Um, I'm going to skip through. I didn't realize that the long-term care folks were meeting separately, um, so I'll just skip through this. But if you do work with nursing homes uh, or, or have nursing homes that are part of your kind of hospital group uh, or your hospital system, um, I, I pulled these slides out from a presentation earlier this year uh, from one of our ID meetings, from, and this is a, um, a physician from the CDC, and I thought these were just really, really good um, ref, reference slides for how to measure antibiotic use in long-term care, because obviously it, it, it can be even more difficult in that setting. So you can kind of, antibiotic starts, I like that one too, that's a good one. I think you could use that in, in some of your um, uh, hospitals as well, so that's a good one. And then this is a great reference, I know there's a lot of pharmacists here, um, and if you're not a pharmacist, find a friend who is a pharmacist and they can probably get you this article. But this is a great review that was written recently by um, a couple ID uh, pharmacists that I know who um, have a nice review on antibiotic stewardship metrics. So it's a good read. They have a really nice reference table, which I um, have copied for you here. And so take a look at that as a reference. Okay. So I'm gonna, so those are kind of that's that's stewardship metrics 101, and so I'm going to kind of talk about advanced metrics, and a lot of the um, recommendations or, or metrics that are on these next slides, um, 
they actually came, I did a workshop a couple, two years ago in Houston, so I, that's where I live now, and we brought together, we bring together actually kind of like you're here together today. Uh, every year we do a stewardship symposium, and so we had a, a working session on metrics. And so we had a lot of hospitals, different hospitals represented, and we kind of brainstormed, like what's everybody doing to track their antibiotic use outside of just the standard you know, DOT and DDD for 1,000 patient days. And so I'm bringing to you what came from that session. And some of them are, I've, I've never done personally, but I think are great ideas. So I wanted to give those to you today uh, for you to take back and, and maybe get inspired um, on some new ways to look at your antibiotic use if you already have a pretty good system in place. So uh, we um, kind of, I, I did mention this one a little bit earlier, but percent of admissions that receive certain antibiotics. Uh, a point prevalence study, that's, that's kind of a fun thing to do. You just pick a day and um, you go through and you say, what, what are people on? And you know, if you're doing an active intervention on a drug, it might be nice to do a point prevalence study or, or a quick survey. It won't, it won't take you too long if you'd only you know, gather a few kind of data points. But maybe in January you do it, and then you do your intervention, and then you come back and, and reassess it in April, and, and just kind of look and see if the patterns have changed. Um, that, that's easier to do than trying to do a big medication use evaluation where you're looking at you know, a bunch of patients over a long period of time. Um, but it's just kind of a, a good, I guess, sort of quick check to see if your, if your um, utilization patterns have changed or if you've made an impact. Um, if you're able to get days of therapy by provider, that's kind of a good one uh, to take a look at. And then average length of therapy for specific antibiotics. I think, you know, I think we spend a lot of time focusing on what antibiotics they're prescribing initially and, and, uh, and are they de-escalating, but we don't always do a good job of looking at days of therapy. And I'll tell you my newest favorite stewardship metric, which that just tells you I should be in stewardship because I'm saying that's, I have my favorite metrics. Um, but my newest favorite stewardship metric is looking at what is the duration of therapy after they go home. So when you send that patient out the door three, four days after they've been admitted, it's fascinating to see how, how many antibiotics they're getting and how long they're getting antibiotics after they leave. They're probably getting a script for another seven to 10 days for you know, a disease state that maybe they only need four to seven days to be treated. So that's real stewardship opportunity. And a lot of you, especially in the smaller community hospitals, could probably easily do that because I'm guessing that you would be able to, to, to you know, get that information pretty easily. So that's my, that's my new favorite one, um, which I should put it on the slide because it's not really on here. So uh, percent of therapy, uh, you know, we can do some administrative um, billing uh, analysis, but that's pretty difficult because, you know, you really have to have a good data set, a data warehouse, and you have to have people who can get that data out of, out of the system. Um, you could look at a percent of time empiric therapy was appropriate for a certain infection. Um, looking at, you know, did they de-escalate change? And then another metric is just looking at your total days of therapy and dividing that by your length of therapy. That's another good metric to take a look at. Uh, this is fancy. This is fancy, fancy metrics. So this was actually a study. It was published, uh, again, by Ron Polk, who really is, is one of the, was one of the leaders in terms of antibiotic stewardship measure, measurements and, and how to measure. Um, but I, I like this study because they actually, instead of looking at um, just you know, overall antibiotic use, they were able to segregate it by MSDRG groupings so they could actually look at antibiotic utilization by different service lines. And so you could see there, I mean, not surprising, um, in this study, they found things like, you know, transplant HIV patients, lung transplant, you'd expect had very high uh, days of therapy per 1,000 patient days. But if you have the ability to go in and pull MSDRG information and you want to try and replicate that, they actually, in the appendix um, of this article online, they have, they have the actual kind of translation guide that they use for this. Um, or if you email me, I can send it to you, uh, or I can send you to Ron, wh whoever you want to talk to. But um, you can easily reproduce that if you have the ability to access that data. Other process measures, I think it's always good, to, especially on the, on the pharmacy side, to look at what interventions you're doing. I think that really helps to kind of show the value of what, what um, you know, you're doing from, a, from an antibiotic stewardship standpoint, looking at how often you're renal dosing, doing your IV to PO, uh, recommending de-escalation of therapy or stopping therapy. 
I just have an example of a hospital that I work with, how they kind of reported their interventions in that graph up on the right-hand side. Um, another good one is what percent of your antibiotics were ordered per protocol or based on guidelines? That's a good one. Um, I think I find a lot of times, though, what I hear a lot is people say, we have guidelines. Uh, but yeah, people don't really use them. So that's another metric you can, you can measure, which is kind of cracks me up. But um, you know, what percent of the time did they get cultures before an antibiotic was, was started or given? Uh, what, what's your intervention acceptance rate? You know, um, I would expect that if you have a, a good stewardship program, you're making good interventions and you have supportive physicians, that that should easily be 90% plus. Um, what are the number of interventions per patient you're reviewing? How many redundant therapy events are there? How many times are you making an intervention or are you seeing duplicate anti-anaerobe therapy? Piperacillin-tazobactam plus metronidazole, that's an easy one. Um, you know, what percent of your orders had a start and a stop date? So making people think about duration of therapy. How often did you see a, a patient that um, had, uh, or, or had MSSA and was getting uh, a beta-lactam and not vancomycin? Um, and then the bundles, which we already kind of talked about in the syndromic talk. Prescriber metrics. I know doctors love these. Don't you? You love these, right? Uh, so this is becoming more common because we have the ability to get the data out um, from systems. I think the challenge, though, is a lot of times when we, when we look at drug use by prescriber, we don't, in, especially in larger institutions, we don't know if that prescriber or I mean, it's probably falling under the attending's name, and it's really a resident that's prescribing, so that can be, you know, there's plus and minuses to that. Um, and I, I, I'm sure it was mentioned in an earlier presentation, I think it might have been, I can't remember if it was Arjun's or not, but, um, you know, he, I think he talked about, um, was it Jeff Linder's study, I think, where they, in primary care, and he was talking about how physicians are competitive. Um, so, you know, that, that if, if it's done in the right way, it can actually be very effective uh, to, to um, report information by prescriber. When I was at the Joint Commission meeting, we were talking about it, and some institutions, what they've started doing is they'll give a physician their individual report. They blind everybody but that physician so that the physician knows, you know, it's not like, hey, you're physician 84. It's like, hey, you know, here's your name, and then here's you compared to your peers, but it blinds all the peers. Um, but then it was funny, at this meeting last week, there were other people who run stewardship programs and they're like, I don't care, I just put it up in the doctor's lounge with everybody's name on it and they can just see how they're doing, you know? So, uh, you know, pick your battles, I guess. <laughs> and she was, she's a really good stewardship physician too, so I, I must be working in her place. But, um, you know, what percent of, uh, uh, of orders that a physician wrote or prescriber wrote that required action? Again, kind of what are the acceptance rates from those interventions? And then another metric that I've used um, is actually ID physician consult rates. And the reason why I've used this is because, you know, there have been some really great stewardship interventions that have occurred at hospitals that I work with that saved lives because a, a pharmacist looked at the order, triaged it up to the ID physician stewardship lead. They went in and realized that the, you know, the pro primary treating physician completely missed you know, some, some really important, like endocarditis case, for example, led to an ID physician consult, got the right diagnosis, got the patient on the right medication. And I think those are, that's not really something, you know, that you can, I mean, you can quantify it, but I think those are the types of things, though, that we also need to be reporting, is some of those anecdotes, because that really shows why stewardship is such a patient safety issue. Um, and I, I have used that, too, to help get support for, why we need either more ID physician resources or why we need ID physician resources um, is, you know, we need to have somebody that's there, that expert that can, that can, um, you know, make sure that the, that we're not, we don't have patients falling through the crack from an infectious disease standpoint. So um, that has been a successful metric or, or statistic that we've reported at some facilities. Um, outcomes. We talk a lot about metrics. There's a lot of metrics. We don't have a lot of really good outcome metrics. In theory, we could say, I mean, in theory, we could say that, um, yeah, we, you know, I mean, in some cases like carbapenem restriction, we can usually see a, a decrease in resistance rates there. But things like levofloxacin res, uh, restrictions, my guess is you're definitely going to see your C. diff rates go down, but you may not see your levofloxacin resistant E. coli rates go down until so-and-so food producers stopped putting quinolones in the chickens, you know? 
because um, there's a lot of there's a lot of community there's a lot of antibiotic pressure in the community outside of the hospital setting, um, and you know in food production. I mean, we use a lot of antibiotics in the production of food, which then leads to resistance. So it's noble, you know, but we may not see the impact of what you do in the hospital from a resistance standpoint immediately or you know even in the next year or two so or, or if ever depends on which drug you're talking about which organism you're talking about but c diff rates that's the one that we can all kind of grab onto because there is good data to show that if you implement stewardship you will see a reduction in c diff rates um, and so here's just another example though this hospital did the, just to kind of share with you um, another facility i work with they did trend and report mrsa isolates per 1,000 patient days because they had implemented stewardship and some other um, infection prevention programs and so we're able to show the impact of that. A Lot of different quality and safety measures. Again, these are great and it really kind of helps elevate stewardship um, to be a patient safety issue, um, but can be m more time consuming to measure. But, um, you know, things like adverse drug events, those are, those are a big, um, uh, that's an easy metric that you can report. Time to appropriate therapy, we do that a lot in sepsis. Time to therapeutic concentration, so those of you who are dosing vancomycin, how long, you know, how long does it take you to get the right antibiotic, I mean, how long does it take you to get vancomycin to the right, um, to appropriate uh, uh, trough levels? Um, and then you can kind of see other things here, and some of this is a little redundant, because I, I think I had it in some other slides. Mortality is super hard. Mortality is super, super hard. This is a nice dashboard. This is from a hospital in Florida that I worked with, and I think it's a nice, clean dashboard. This is how they report their data at a stewardship committee. Um, I, I've seen a lot of dashboards. I have tons and tons of dashboards, but I like this one. It's kind of nice. They show their top 10 antibiotic days of therapy per 1,000 patient days. You know, they don't monitor more than 10. They just pick their top 10. This is 80% of their drug use anyhow. Um, they, look, they do report costs on there, so top 10 antibiotic spend. Um, they have some, some kind of infection or, or HAI metrics on the right. I, I took the data out because I didn't want to show their data on here. Um, the pharmacist, ASP intervention frequency, and then here's those kind of anecdotes. Now, now this is the pharmacist putting it together. I might, you know, I might change it to more it, just ASP notable interventions or stewardship team notable interventions. Um, but, you know, these are where you can use those anecdotes to kind of help drive support for your program. So I don't have time to, to go through um, this in a lot of detail, but basically I think what the thing about metrics is just make sure that you're using the same methodology, it's consistent and reproducible, you're sharing it with the right people, and you're measuring the progress. The one thing I'll say about metrics though, and especially if you're gonna do a dashboard or, or, or some kind of you know, monthly monitoring, I challenge you set goals around that. Don't just measure to measure. A lot of people just measure to measure because they want to have that nice thing to show joint commission when they show up. But really set your goals. So if my days of therapy are, you know, per 1,000 patient days are, are, I'll just make it up, like 400 days of therapy per 1,000 patient days, my goal by the end of the year might be to, to drop that by 10%. So that's what I would challenge you with metrics is really, really important um, to set goals around that, not just report them. So this is a really, um, I've uh, uh, got a couple resources f um, for you there. That's the full citation for that, for Nick Bennett's article. And then um, there's a nice little reference I found from Mount Sinai Hospital, which is up in Toronto, uh, where they also walk through how to do that DDD calculation. So with that, thanks for your time. There's my email, and I would be happy to take a couple questions if we got a couple minutes. So. No. All right, thanks. I, oh, yeah, oh, one. Go ahead. No, no, go ahead. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. So one of the questions that we get a lot is, um, how do we know whether our amount of antibiotic use is <laughs> high or low? Is there a way beyond the CDC system to benchmark? Or how do, you, how do, you, how do smaller facilities do that? Yeah. So. Um, Outside of what's available through the CDC, there are other antibiotic benchmarking tools and resources, but they're all commercial. So you, they would require you to pay a subscription. Um, and, and to be honest with you, I mean, part of the reason for that is that, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to pay people to support 
a database, if you're gonna, you know, you have to get your data in it, but then you have to pay people to, to maintain and support that. So there's a cost associated with that, but um, there are a you know, few different commercial kind of groups that I know of that, um, that have that um, ability. So I would say though, if you don't have those resources and you still wanna do it, you know, get together with your friends, especially if you're in a, you know, a, a hospital and you know there's some neighboring hospitals, you could all, as long as you guys are kind of using the same methodology, then it, it can still be effective. And, but that's the important thing is you can't, like, you can't use levofloxacin. You can't say, well, my DDD of levofloxacin is 0.75. And then you say, well, mine's 0.25 and mine's 0.5. Like, you've kind of got to standardize. Um, so you can do that sort of grassroots effort. But yeah, that's a good question.